First off, I would just want to say the collective whole is super important, I think, in order for uh, transformation to happen and to see the actual results. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM. Brain FM combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. I love it and have been using it to write, create, and do some of my deepest work. Because you're a listener of the show, you can get a free trial. Head over to brain.fm slash innovative mindset to check it out. If you decide to subscribe, you can get 20% off with the coupon code innovative mindset, all one word. And now let's get to the show. Oh my goodness, we've just been laughing so hard. Hi, this is Zelda Trachtenberg with the Innovative Mindset Podcast, and I bid you welcome. I'm super excited about this week's guest. You can tell Meredith is already laughing. <laughs> We're both cracking up, but you need to you need to hear about Meredith Grundy. Check it out. And I did I say it right or is it Grundy? I dug on it. See, Grundy. We've just had good. this fabulous conversation about name changing when you are <laughs> when you have the opportunity to do so and Grundy is is the is the name that is the right name and I'm going to say it correctly so here we go Meredith Grundy doggone it I'm going to get it right as eventually as an award-winning theater director producer and former Second City improv teacher Meredith recognized the similarities between performing on stage every night and presenting to clients and colleagues every day but the latter didn't have the right tools to bring their stories to life, so she decided to do something about it. You know this is catnip to me. If you're if you're a longtime <laughs> listener of this show, you know how much I love what this is and what Meredith does. So 11 years and some change later, Grundy Coaching has helped thousands of individuals and corporations around the world achieve career growth and success. Meredith specializes in presentation and public speaking consultation, individual training and development, and creative team solutions using applied improv, improvisational theater techniques to build trust, empathy, and out-of-the-box thinking. Wow, this is this is so exciting for me because we're going to get really deep into some of this. I'm Ooh, so I thrilled to it. have you here, Meredith. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I am so happy to be here. This is, I'm like so, I'm just giddy on the inside about the conversation that is about to emerge. I certainly hope so. Unless, unless my cat comes in like the, like he did the other day and jumps on the microphone and everything goes all over the place. We'll improvise. <laughs> there you go. You'll improvise. I, I took very few improv <laughs> classes in theater. I'll, I'll, I'll try and yes, yes, yes and you as much as possible. It. I love it. So, so talk to me a little bit about that. What, how did you get from theater director, producer, improv teacher, professor, all of these things to now you help people and companies get their message out? How did that come about? Oh, that's a really great question. It's organically come about over time. I've always seen myself and as a multi-passionate human. And I remember the very first time someone said to me, I believe it was in high school, you're a jack of all trades. Mm. But she said it in kind of a negative way. Hmm. And, you know, um, you know, that jack of all trades, master of none kind of way. And, right, right. and it, it, at first I thought, this is my handicap that I... I have all these passions because I was dancing, I was acting, but I loved organizing. I worked in the career center. I just have always loved these things. My dad was an entrepreneur, so he he was always, I was always inspired by him and always curious about exactly what he did. He also had a job that I could never understand, but he hmm. did these other things that were just exciting. I was like, wow, you're opening a dry cleaners and now you're opening a virtual reality games place. And now you're, so I was always just really in awe of that. And then when I, I moved to San Francisco when I graduated from college and I started performing with an improv group called Ad Nauseam. And I'd taken at that time maybe one improv class in high school mm -hmm. and I met these this group of people through BATS and I had taken a couple courses there and I just started to love, I just fell in love with it immediately and then ended up in a sketch comedy group called Old Man McGinty and we'd do this crazy like very absurdist kind of sketch comedy. It was hmm. this really dynamic group of 
performers that had these wonderful like dance ability, writers, and a lot of experimental theater performers, clowns, so forth. And so we put this group together, and one of our members was like, I'm moving to Chicago, I'm going to study improv. And I'm like, ooh, I want to go to Chicago. I want to study improv. So I'm like, let's do it. And at that time, I had just gotten married, and we jet-setted to Chicago, and I started interning my way through I.O., Improv Olympic, And the next thing I know, I am then teaching at the Second City, and I'm helping start their youth program there. Mm. And because one of the core faculty members was co-teaching a class with me that was teaching kids how to create their own work. And so I started that. I started working at the Second City. It was a wonderful experience for me. And I was always inspired by the people that I was working with and for. And I did a couple, at that time it was called BizCo gigs, teaching to more corporate folk, if you will, Mm -hmm. and helping them find ways to work better and more efficiently as teams using improvisation as a tool to do that. And then from there, this executive coach, Dennis Schroeder, pulled me in and was like, I want you to work with me and all the time. So I was like, okay. And I I do the Berkman assessment, which is a psychological assessment similar to DISC and Myers-Briggs. And he said, I'm going to, this is how I work as an executive coach with these teams. And then I want you to come in and let's use applied improv as a way to show these personal, these different personality types and how they can work together as an asset and better communicate with each other as a team and trust and all of that. And so for several years, and I actually am still in touch with Dennis and do the occasional work with him, I, I, I just ended up doing that work and loving it because I saw the opportunities to help people not only engage with each other, but to also find a safe and brave space to share story, which I, it was astounding to me how many organizations did not provide the space, whether that was conscious or unconscious, for people to actually share what is, like what's going on in their lives, what's, what, they're, what they don't feel that they can bring into the, the, the work space, right? Because you leave, you leave your personal life at home. And I'll I'll never forget this one experience where I was working with a a team, a manufacturing team up in upstate New York in Rochester. And I have this Augusta Ball exercise and Augusta Ball is a Brazilian practitioner who brought, he's no longer with us, but he, he used improv and theater as a tool to bring community together and people of, of different backgrounds and ethnicities and so forth. And this one exercise is called, and it made me think. And so what you do is each person is given one minute to tell a story about something that's happened in their life and in relatively recent, right? A relatively recent time frame. So in the last week or last month, and uh, you punctuate it, you tell your story, and then you punctuate it with, and it made me think, and then you allow space to sit. And so you allow that story to land on the listeners. And this one gentleman, we come to this one man in the circle, and he shares his story about his son who's been going through chemotherapy. Hmm. No one on that team knew. No one. And that, to me, blew my mind. Like, this poor man has been holding this painful thing and expected to work and expected to show up and to do his job. And that was a moment for me where I went, I, this is important. This is what I'm doing. This work, not I, more people need to be doing this work. More people need to be going into organizations and using these tools of the theater and of improv to help open up the hearts and the minds of the individuals that are doing this work. So I just got the bug and I just kept doing it from there on. And I started doing it on my own with Meredith Grundy coaching. And within that, I was also invited by Dennis. I'll give him credit. He was like, I've got this CEO. Please help him with his presentation. He has to give at this big conference. I've got this guy over here who needs to uh, level up his executive presence. I've got this person over here. And I would yes and things. And I think it's a Tina Fey quote, but she was like, say yes 
and figure out the rest later, <laughs> which is kind of <laughs> what I felt like I was doing. And it's led me to this this wonderfully this wonderful path that I'm on and I haven't looked back and I don't think I will I mean I I, I what was I what am I trying to say here <laughs> that was a rough drafted thought anyway that's that's how I got here wow 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 that's fantastic and so much of what you said to me what I heard it, it is I, I heard courage it was that was one of the things that that I it seems like you help people bring out, you know, have sort of pull themselves into themselves, but then have the courage to express to actually say what's on their mind or do what they want to do and be more of themselves, especially in corporate situations. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that we started talking about that you mentioned was improv. And I would love it. Because I have a whole list of questions mm -hmm. uh, based on what you just said. There's a ton. And what what is improv? What What is improvisational theater? What is improv? Because people bandy the term around, but I'm not sure how many people actually know what it means, what it is, and what it can do for you. Well, that's a great question. So improv, I will start off with the one thing that people most commonly can relate to when I describe it in front of a group, which is I always reference like, have you seen whose line is it anyway? <laughs> and then people, I see a bunch of people nodding up and down and I'm nodding up and down as I'm sharing this story with you right now. So that would be the first context to it is like, whose line is it anyway? They have a structure, a game, if you will. And within that game, so the, the structure are the quote unquote, and I'm doing air quotes, are the rules. <laughs> Mm -hmm. right and you make things up on the spot within that structure though so the structure gives you some guidelines so that's what i do is i teach people these games these exercises these activities however you want to frame that that best fits for you i give them these games that they work within so that they can see the magic that happens afterwards, right? And I give them other tools, like the foundation of improvisation is this idea of yes and. So when we yes and somebody's idea, we can further the storyline, we can add to the idea, we can find that moment of agreement, right? And so with that tool and within these structures, these games that I give them, we're able to make discoveries about ourselves within the context of the game. So for example, to me, the applied improv piece is uh, the magic is in the debrief, right? So what did you notice come up for you when you were put in this situation? What feelings were in your body when this happened? What did you notice in your communication when this happened? What is it that you would do differently next time if we were to do this exercise again, were you making eye contact? Were you breathing? Oftentimes when we feel stressed out or anxiety, we hold our breath, right? Do these exercises up on our feet. So it's a full body experience. We spend so much time sitting down that I think that physical engagement, that somatic kinesthetic engagement is incredibly important as well. So that I hope answers the question, what is improv? And it's also an amazing opportunity to get people to just laugh together. So you're laughing together, you're getting amazing insights on your own communication skills, you're building trust, and there are no real world consequences within the containers. So we're not gonna like, some multi-billion dollar uh, organization is not going to implode because we're doing improv games. <laughs> I certainly hope not. That would be right? one heck of an improv game if you did that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and you rubbed your hands together right there, didn't you? I did. You? I did uh, the finger thing. <laughs> so that's that's a that's a fabulous that's a fabulous encapsulation of what improv is and something that that sparked for me when you said that was the questions that you asked, the debrief as you put it. It's it, you're calling on people, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it seems like you're calling on people to have a, a, a deeper awareness of self, yep. of, of who they are, of where they are, of what's happening inside them. And often 
we don't. We don't. We tend to, to think outwardly. You know, we tend to go, oh, this is this is on my to do list today. This is these are the things that I have to get done. This is the work that I have to do. But we don't tend to spend a lot of time internally and going, what about the work I'm doing on myself? So it sounds like there's an invitation inherent in what you're doing for people to work on themselves. And I'm wondering how does how does that work for you? How do you how do you employ that? And if you do specifically, and what are the results that you get at the end of the process? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I think it's the way that I guide people through things that I give them the invitation to drop in and think in those ways. And I do always call it an invitation. I don't try to force things upon people. I think it's important for people to make their own discoveries. Mm -hmm. And so I, I repeat myself a lot in the debrief. So touch in, you know, I have an Allen Ginsberg quote that I like to use often, which is notice what you notice. And then I feel like the more that I can repeat back the things that I'm inviting people to do, whether they make those discoveries in the room or on the Zoom room, if you will, these days, but in the room with me, great. But they may not make those discoveries until a month later when they're sitting at their desk and something happens that triggers a response or a strong emotion. And then they can reflect back to that exercise. So I think that there's time and space for integration with these things and the repetition can help with that. I hope that answered the first part of your question. Can you repeat the second part of your question? Sure. The, the second part was actually really about, like you said, they might notice months later. I, I recently noticed something that I did in a theater class in college many, many years ago and sort of got an aha moment from that. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. when you go through the process in the moment, if you have any stories about those results so that you can see them, so that they're like the, the gentleman whose, whose son had, who was going through chemo, the people there were changed, right? The results were pretty yeah. immediate by hearing his story. And I'm wondering, I guess I'm, I'm being a little bit, you know, I'm being a little shameless because I'm like, Tell me, tell me the results, Meredith. Tell me the good stuff, you know. But, Fair but, enough. <laughs> you know, but but it's it's because I think we don't spend a lot of time in that space of yeah. going, wow, this this has changed me, and let me spend a little time figuring out how it has changed me. So in those in those spaces when you're, because you're holding space for people to be themselves, which I love. What what are the profound results, small and large? in those processes? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think there are multiple. One, one is how you work collectively as a team. And that, that's why I think the work is important to do. And I think that's why leadership needs to show up to, you know, because oftentimes I've noticed that leadership will set something up for their team. Mm. Management will, and then management won't be there. So all of these people have learned, their team has learned this like great new set of tools, and then management isn't there. So that, first off, I would just want to say the collective whole is super important, I mm. think, in order for uh, transformation to happen and to see the actual results. For me, it's about, for example, seeing the results. How do you organize a meeting? Right. So because of some of the tools in the, in the debrief, we find out where some of the pain points are and how they can be solved through those exercises. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an, for example, in an ideation phase or you're a part of an agile or scrum group or you're whatever the industry might be and you're in that first infant stages of creation, when everyone in the group has this idea of what yes and is and how it can be applicable, it shifts things. Let's get all the ideas up on the whiteboard or on the post-it notes and let's see what emerges without saying no. There will be room for no later. There will mm -hmm. be room for, I see this and can we do this later? Just get all the ideas out there because what that also does is it, it creates a room of inclusivity. So all voices get to be heard. Nobody is being cut off. Nobody is being told no. All ideas are good ideas at that moment in time because what happens is in ideation, in brainstorming and creativity, we want to, it's so often that we want to look at what's not working first 
And I'm a big fan of looking at like, well, let's look at what is working and let's get it all out there because whatever, if, if, this no, if you have an instant to a no, that no actually might inspire the idea that does work. Does that make sense? Absolutely. No, it absolutely it does. And it's interesting because as I'm listening to you, I'm going, the, the people who are actually doing the work, nobody knows their job better than they do. You know, nobody knows right. what you do better than you do. So if you're going to ask for ideas and make the caveat that there are no bad ones, just throw them out. Some of those people have never been heard from before. And it sounds yep. like you're giving them the, the, the stage, if you will, the opportunity. And then they can present their own. I do something similar with some of the workshops I do, giving space so that people yeah. who aren't often heard from can can have their say and i love what you said about leadership being invited and almost mandatory show up folks because that presents an opportunity for them to to see some of those ideas that they otherwise might not see right yeah exactly and they also get to see the dynamics of the group they get to see how people work together in these different situations that they may not be able to see in the day-to-day -day grind of the, the work day. Yeah, absolutely. And that's so interesting. So talk to me about team dynamics. What is that? What is team dynamics? You mentioned it a couple of times, and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on exactly what it is and how we can use it specifically, because this is the Innovative Mindset Podcast. <laughs> how can we use it to innovate? How can we use it to think creatively? Yeah, well, the first place that I go to is using each other's different sets of skills as an asset, right? And so that we look at, so I'll just bring it back to like what Dennis works with, with the different personality types. We all have different ways of seeing and approaching an idea or a, a problem solving and finding a solution to something, right? My husband and I could not be more different in how we problem solve something, but it's how we choose to work together and communicate in order to solve that problem. And so what I really appreciate about using these, like I said before, they have no real world, what is the word I'm looking for? <laughs> no consequences. Thank you, ding, ding, ding. They have no real world consequences, right? But what it does is it really helps bring to the surface these different personality types and rather getting frustrated with that person who might be more on the execution thing and or getting m more really uptight around that person who's the out of the box creative thinker. It's like, how do you take those two different personality types and put them together so that they can actually work efficiently and effectively together and see each other's different ty personality types as an asset to the to solving a problem. So when I talk about team dynamics, I mean, that to me, it's about yes, anding each other, seeing each other and our zones of brilliance and how they can all fit together so that we can be effective and efficient with the, our day-to-day -day work and tasks and show each other mutual respect and honor each other's differences. Oh, I love that you just said that last part because that's one of the things that I find happens is that that can sometimes be missing that 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 respecting that other people think differently and that not only is it okay but it's to be celebrated because they can come at it from a perspective yeah. you may not have seen so let me ask you a, a, a strange question and maybe it's not a strange question mm -hmm. I imagine there are times when you're doing one of these workshops that you meet resistance from the people and all the Time. Yeah, I, 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 I'm like, yeah, this is kind of a silly question. It's not because, a strange question at all. <laughs> and and so, you know, because some people, given the room to play, may be afraid of playing, if you see what I mean. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. what, when you meet resistance, how, what are the innovative ways that you encourage, invite, inspire people to to let go of the fear a little or maybe to push through the fear. I'm not sure what 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 your way is in mm -hmm. order to actually get the best out of the experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a wonderful question. And I will say the most resistant resistance that I am met with is usually at the very beginning. Mm. I walk into the room and I oftentimes get the who is this person? What's happening? Why are we forced to do this? Like you can just feel the energy in the room is palpable. Mm. 
And, uh, and it's not all the time. I mean, sometimes you've got the one person in the room that's like, I love improv. <laughs> and then you're like, thank God for you being in the room, right? And, and so what happens is pretty quickly, I have everyone gather in a circle. I have them push their chairs back. And, you know, uh, if I can get into the room to arrange it the way that I would like it to, to be the best learning experience possible for everyone, I do that. Sometimes I can't do that. So it's a little bit of a rearranging, right? And in that moment, I'm warming myself up. I'm introducing myself to people. I'm giving them eye contact. I'm making sure they know that I'm not as scary. I don't look scary to, be, to begin with. I'm like five foot three and I weigh 100 pounds. So if they're scared <laughs> of me, that's a bigger issue. But so then I gather people into a circle and we, we do you know some gradual warm-ups and and I get to know who they are they get to know me and what happens is quite it's beautiful I will say it's just beautiful is that somehow within that time frame within the first 30 minutes of being there I have given them permission to play Mm. and it's as if no one else has given them that permission in a really long time and I can't tell you it's the most wonderful, beautiful shift that I have ever experienced in a room is with people who are non-performers, who have no idea what they're about to get into. And then all of a sudden they understand it and they're like, oh my God, I get to just play for three hours. Awesome. And so that is usually, I will say, That's most of my experiences. Every so often, you'll get the one person. It's usually one person, and I hate to say it, but it's usually a guy Mm. who has a lot of resistance. And so I... There, it's a fine balance, right? Because you don't want that person to take up airtime for everybody else. You don't want to... So it's a delicate balance of uh, agreement and saying, let's take a risk here and let's look at your own stuff. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes it it works out okay, right? And I'm a big fan of doing I touch back in too and I and I notice these things and I feel like I might send an email and do a check-in with that person later or I might check in with their management later because I do care and I want to know where the resistance is living in the body and or in the mind and or with past experiences because even though the work is playful even though we are having a good time with each other it can still bring up stuff for people it just can sure we're humans so with with lots of layers and somehow within the layers of that onion there was one that I really I got at with some people so putting care and love into it I love I, again. I love that you said that. I'm going to just say that after everything you say. Uh, <laughs> a, and it's interesting what you were talking about. Like every once in a while, the person with real resistance. I find that digging deeper means that they are that they are a frustrated performer, or that they were told that they shouldn't speak, or sh- or or don't have talent or skills in the very thing that that they want to do, which is be out there with with the bad selves. And so there's this there's this confidence piece and there's a there's a vulnerability piece to the to what I'm hearing you talk about that I would love to explore for a minute. What I know you've already mentioned that there's lots of vulnerability, even though we're playing and even though we're having a good time, there's there's a real vulnerability to to stepping into the limelight, if you will. And when when someone does, I'm sure that you've had lots of stories about that, but when they do that, how does, how do you handle it? And how does the rest of the group transform? Because it's not just the individual person that transforms. I imagine the rest of the group transforms also when someone is really vulnerable. Yeah. That's a really good question. I'm trying to think. Well, I keep going back to that one story. There's a couple stories that have popped into my head. I think in those moments for me, I think each situation is different. So I do adapt according to each of the situations. Mm -hmm. And I might have, for example, a game that follows the exercise that we just did. And for me as the coach, as the facilitator, it's important to know what to let go of. Mm-hmm. for the betterment of the whole. And so there have been a couple times where I've had to let go of my agenda so that I could best meet the group with where they're at. Mm-hmm. And 
And I'm not overly transparent about that. I just go with the flow and then we, we spend our attention in that place. And then there's an opportunity for further dialogue. And I, I always do feel that it is the way that the rules of engagement that are set up beforehand are helpful in facilitating this as well, because I come from a place of, I want to hear, I want to hear from you what feels true. I want to hear what's working. And then I want to hear where you have curiosities around this feeling or within this exercise that we just had that came up for you. The feelings that you have are completely valid and they're yours. They're nobody else's. So let's all figure this out together and let's find a way to communicate this that feels safe. And so I, I hope that answered your question. Did it? <laughs> Yes, it did. That <laughs> <Okay>, was good. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny about this show is that the a lot of the feedback that I get from the show is that, wow, these conversations go so deep. And we do. So yeah, yes, you I answered it. it. <laughs> good. Well, you know, I had a, I, another story that popped in my head is that it was a disaster story where we it was a huge organization. And the person who organized it was going through a lot of stuff. And so it was not organized very, very well at all. And I had, I was met with serious resistance. And mm-hmm. then the, or the, 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 per- the client was not happy. And so in that moment, I literally dropped everything, rallied the troops and was like, we, because there was six of us on this gig, and I was responsible for having brought in like five of the six of oh, all of us. <laughs> I was responsible for bringing in these people. And I was like, we need to shift gears. And we had to do a whole, like we changed the whole curriculum, the whole thing, everything because of what what happened. And I think that's, you know, I think that's something improv has taught me is to be adaptable, be in the moment, be a problem solver. If you dig in your heels, it's not it, because you had one thing planned and it's not working out the way that you think it's going to work out, then you're going to be in a lot of trouble, a lot. And so I have learned so often, you just got to sometimes say, yep, you're right. This isn't working. And now we're going to figure out a new solution to this. And I am so grateful for that tool. And it's a great tool because if you are not adaptable, you're pushing up a really heavy boulder up that hill. Oh my God. And some people think they're adaptable. And I got to say, you're not. I'm so sorry, but you're not being adaptable. <laughs> yeah. And that that can be a, a tough a tough nut to swallow, right? if you will. Um, so, so, you know, it's interesting. We've been talking a lot about courage and talking about confidence and in, in its relationship to, to the teams that you work with within within a presentation. And I'm wondering, there's something you, you mentioned way earlier that you got drawn to helping people be themselves in certain kinds of situations, in mm-hmm. whether it's corporate or not. But you're, you, you said you were drawn to helping people. And I'm wondering... What what draws you to helping people become better at at not just the oh we're working well as a team but at public speaking and presenting and being up in front of others and telling their own story like what what draws you about that and how do you do that? Mm, thank you. I have always just maybe it's I I went to church camp a lot as a kid and then I ended up becoming a camp counselor and all of these things. And I feel like I just, from a very young age, loved teaching and loved helping other people find their voices. And I feel like, you know, partly it's because, you know, in my childhood and when I was uh, more in my teenage years, I have a father who had PTSD and I found it tremendously difficult to have a voice in my family to be heard. And so I think that I am very sensitive to other people who also struggle with being heard in the way they want to. So I would say that would probably be the core, the root of it. And I'm a huge advocate of mentorship. I I love, I just feel like it's so important, especially in this day and age, to, to help lift the voices of others, to tell them that, yes, they can achieve whatever they want to achieve, that they can, that they can they can overcome adversity and that just feels it just lights me up it it just it really does and 
I, I guess that's the best answer I have for you is I can't imagine myself doing anything else but working with people. I'm I am quite the empath too. <laughs> like some to uh, sometimes to a fault, <laughs> right? Where I'm like I overthink things. But I really do care about people. I really do care about their experiences and making sure that they have a voice in the room and in this world. And again, I love that. See, this I just keep saying that. And I and I am not at all surprised that you're an empath. And being able to do that, being so able to be sensitive to the, the the place where other people are what they're feeling what they're what they're perhaps thinking all of that it changes how you relate to them and mm -hmm. if someone has a real fear like I used to have a phobia not not, not that not that you can tell now since I'm all over the place as far as speaking but I used to have a real phobia of public speaking mm -hmm. from learning English as a fourth language and being terrified and I I worked through it I overcame it and now I'm out there presenting all the time and I'm actually grateful to that time because it helped me understand what other people are going through mm -hmm. when they're afraid. And so when you're when you're coaching someone to improve their skills at presenting or if they have a presentation that they have to do and they're terrified, what do you do to help them? <sighs> yes. Well, I at first I always start with where they're at and where they want to go and how they want to be seen. And I am, a, my philosophy is to give as many tools as I possibly can because I don't think it's a one size fits all for everybody. I think that with as many tools as I can possibly give them, they can find what works best for them, right? So the tools that I will provide my clients are breathing exercises physical exercises because the mind body connection is incredibly important the mm -hmm. heart centered mind body connection is important i give them different tools on how to prepare right how to practice because there's more than one way to practice there is no set acronym that's going to teach you how to become an amazing person you know a rehearser <laughs> Is that even a word? <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. Today it is. <laughs> and so I, I just feel that what I have found over time is that people would tell me, this is how you do it. This is how it's done. And then I would go back, like as an actor, I would get all of these, this input on how I was supposed to practice or how I was supposed to memorize my lines or how I was supposed to, how I was supposed to do this, do this, do this. And I noticed that no one ever gave me permission to sit back and try to figure out what worked for me, right? Because everyone has an opinion. Everyone's opinion is going to be different from the last person's opinion. That's just the way it is. So you really giving that permission for people to find what works for them and giving them enough tools to be able to do that. I'm taking it in for a second. Sorry. I, I like I, I like to take a second and really synthesize what I've just heard. The thing, the key for me of what you just said is that it's a two pronged approach. The, mm -hmm. what is it that you need to do? And then here are the tools to help you do it. Like what will, what will work for you mm -hmm. may not work for anybody else, right? What works mm -hmm. for me may not work for anybody else, but giving permission and not just you giving them permission, but them giving themselves permission to explore, I think is so crucial. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you innovate that? How do you encourage people who might have a phobia, like, like I used to, to give themselves permission, not just to play, but to go deep and explore into who they are and into what, what is it that they want to say, what their message is? Yeah, I'll give you an example of one thing. So I have this group called Confidently Co Confidently Speaking, which is a group coaching on Mighty Networks thing that I put together, and it's only a month old. And I do a Q and A, so it's it's four weeks or geez, every 
it's four weeks. Yes, every month. Each week <laughs> I have a geez Louise. Each week I have a different focus. And on the fourth week of the month, I do a QA. And that mm-hmm. feels important to me so that people can ask their questions and they can also provide me feedback so that I can better grow the community. And what I heard from the last QA is there was some struggle with feeling confidence around being in front of the camera and being in front of the camera and communicating your message and your brand is huge and we're getting more and more on video I mean every I think things are going to turn more in that direction than ever before and so I heard all of that and I said okay well then we're going to do a 30-day video challenge and if three of you sign up I'm going to do it with you because it's important that you see that I'm going to go and do this alongside of you Mm -hmm. And we're all going to learn together. And then we're going to come together at the end of this 30-day challenge. And we're going to share what we learned when we started and where we're at. And we're going to share where we're at now. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives people permission to go, wow, my coach is doing this alongside of me because I always have something to learn too. I'm I'm not like a master at all of these things, you know, I mean, there are masters, but masters in something are still educating themselves and learning. And it also helps people feel like they're not alone in, in this growth period in their life. And that's why I like the group coaching and that peer to peer support piece of it is because you can really quickly see I'm not the only one that feels this way, Mm. that there's still a lot of work to be done. And and it's okay that I'm at where I'm at right now. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting. There's a there's a wonderful book by Pemba Chodron. Oh, I love Pemba Chodron. Oh, yay. Yes. yay. Me too. <laughs> I love her work. And I love the book title almost more than I love the book. It's Start Where You Are. Yes. I, I just think that's so, it's so simple and so profound at the same time mm-hmm. that giving yourself permission to start where you are and not judging yourself for not being further along than you are you know so so have you done the full 30 days yet how how have the stories been about the people who have taken the challenge on with you we are on day two we just started (laughs) we just started it's pretty awesome and there's there's a couple people that i was not expecting that totally jumped in and i am so excited i'm so excited that it just gets i i just i am just thrilled to pieces when people take the risk Mm -hmm. and i've given them the platform to do so like we did a story exercise a couple of weeks ago and a couple of people chose to put their stories on video. I said, you know what, however you need to tell that story, tell it. If it's typing it and sending it to us in a document, if it's putting it on video, just tell your story. So I think, again, it's giving them the permission to use it. There's no right, there's no one way to do something. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. The, you know, <laughs> it's one of my, one of my favorite things is on a circle, you can get to the center point from an infinite number of places. And that, yeah. that is that to me is says so much. And there is no, no, that's not true. I will say that there are wrong ways, like forgetting <laughs> to turn your camera off, uh, on or yeah. off or whatever, you know, sure. Right. But, right. but at the same time. <laughs> so, yeah, because I've done that. I've done, I've recorded entire podcast episodes without having turned on the recording equipment. So, so that has happened. And, and yet it's a, it's a mo, it's a teaching and a learning opportunity for yourself. Yes. I was just going to ask, but what did you learn from that? Exactly. (laughs) What did you do different next time? So yeah, now I have a checklist hanging over my desk that says, these are the things you have to do. And again, that, that's, that to me is a really important piece of what you're doing is that you don't have to be perfect. Mm -mm. You have to be where you are, you know, wherever you are. And if you can stretch yourself, that's great. So so within that, is there a place that someone can go to to go, I want to learn from Meredith, where should they go to do that, to find you? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I can be found in a few places. One is grundicoaching.com, and that's G-R-U-N as in Nancy, D as in dog, E-I dot com. Meredith, yeah, grundicoaching.com. And then confidentlyspeaking.club. It's 
hosted on Mighty Networks. So you could also look through Mighty Networks. And then I have my performance. I still am a performer on MeredithGrundi.com. And my name is spelled with two I's. It's M-E-R-I-D-I-T-H Grundi.com. And then, of course, LinkedIn and all the socials. I'm not on Facebook, though. I got off Facebook. It was driving me batty. <laughs> I hear you. Uh, that, <laughs> that, that is one of those things. And there's, I, I could he- keep you here for the next six hours and, and chat with I you. I know. I love talking to you. <laughs> it's so much fun. You ask me I, your questions. I'm like, I love your questions. <laughs> And I'm like, did I answer it? I hope I answered it. <laughs> You're fabulous. Yes, you absolutely have. There's there's a couple more questions if, if you have time. Yeah. First of all, I was honored to be on your podcast recently. Yes, you were. And it was so much fun. So I'm really glad that you were able to come and, and join me here on, on in, uh, Innovative Mindset. So I'm the, the podcast is called Are You Waiting for Permission that mm-hmm. you co-host with mm-hmm. a wonderful gentleman named Joseph Bennett. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what the podcast is and what permission people might be waiting for. Yeah, the, so the podcast is inspired by well, Joseph on a Sunday, I think about four months ago. It's only four months old. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Uh, he said he woke up and he was like, I want to do a podcast with Meredith. And so he called me and I said, sure, let's do a podcast. <laughs> And we came up with this title, Are You Waiting for Permission? Joseph, I think, was reading a book, and it was a line in a book. And I said, perfect. This is that. Yes. And it is intended for creatives and artists who stopped waiting for permission. And so they started giving themselves permission to live the life that they want and to create the work that they want and to follow their dreams. And we... Our intention with the podcast is we really want our listeners to f- to see that there are multiple ways that they can to give themselves permission to follow their dreams. And we even have one listener who quit her job. <laughs> she said, I listened to your podcast and that was it. I had this email sitting in the inbox for two years and I finally sent it and I quit my job that I was miserable at. Wow. And uh that that was really and we of course we had to interview her on our podcast and we did and that will be released in the next uh, few weeks but that is our that is our hope with the podcast is to keep encouraging people to take leaps of faith to take risk and to give themselves permission and through that we give resources we answer questions now for people on the podcast as well and we invite speakers you know, guests like yourself who are dynamic humans that have also carved a path. And it's a fabulous podcast. If you're not listening, you should go su- subscribe just like right now. And that's <laughs> that. Uh, no, it, it is. I enjoy it. I enjoy it because it's like you called yourself a multi-passionate person, but also the guests tend to be multi-passionate and yes. tend to want to explore different avenues and i am about i am multi-passionate doesn't begin to cover all of that that i try to do and i've decided for myself that it's not do what you love for me it's love what you're doing while you're doing it and Mm. that's (laughs) that's 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 my solution to to that whole conundrum and so i'm i'm really glad that you that you both started this show because I find that I'm learning and I'm having a good time. And often you, you get podcasts where you have one or the other maybe, but not both. And Mm -hmm. yours, yours does both, which I think is great. And I think that's what you're doing with the work that you're doing is that people, yes, you're, you're calling on them to be vulnerable and have, and have courage and you're giving them a space to play and explore who they are and I think that's amazing so thank you so much for doing the work that you're doing I really it's necessary in this world so I'm really glad you're out there doing it oh thank you so Meredith I have one last question and by the way all of the all of the social media and all of the ways to contact you will be in the show notes as well but people learn differently so I like to give both both ways of seeing or multiple ways of seeing the information or hearing the information and I have one last question that I ask everybody who comes on the show and I find it's a silly question but I find that it can yield some some profound answers so the question is this 
If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Just breathe. <sighs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. It's so, that's a great, what a great answer. Yes, so important. So important. I, I like to say that you can last three weeks without food. You can last three days without water, but you can only last three minutes without air. So breathing yeah. is crucial. Crucial. It is so crucial. And oh. we don't do it enough. We yeah. hold our breath so much. Yeah. And and one of the things that's most interesting to me about the theater that I, I was an English drama major in college. And one of the things that was most interesting to me was when I first started really learning how to use breath to perform, mm -hmm. to to play. I, I play violin, so breathing is not, it's not a woodwind or a brass instrument or whatever. But at the same time, breathing as part of singing, breathing as part of doing anything gives yourself space as mm -hmm. well as being nourishing for your for your body and your mind and your spirit. So I'm so grateful that you said that. What a wonderful way of looking at it. Meredith, I'm super grateful that you took the time to be on the show. I thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Isolde. I have, I, this has been a wonderful conversation, so thank you. And I hope you'll come back. Oh, I will. I hope you come <laughs> back to our podcast, too. I'd be delighted. So <laughs> we started the episode giggling, and we're finishing it we're giggling. Gonna, yes. <laughs> I Full love it. Full circle. Big fan. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You have been listening to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. This has been a fabulous conversation with Meredith Grundy, and I hope that you will check out both Confidently Speaking and Are You Waiting for Permission and all the other incredible work that Meredith is doing. If you're enjoying these episodes, please do me a favor, rate and review the show. I'd love to hear from you about what you're thinking about the show, where it's going. Very soon on July. No, actually, this this airs way after. We've already celebrated our 400th episode. Can you believe it? Wow. 400 episodes. That's amazing. I'm I super love thrilled. It. Yeah, it's exciting. So I hope that you're enjoying the show. And I will remind you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show... I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset.